is the situation now around the world, and in particular with Europe, uh, in relation to quarantine? If I went to France, Spain, Italy tomorrow, what would happen to me? Well, if you go tomorrow, by then we would have heard the announcement, which is that, I mean, currently you can fly even today to European countries. And if you are flying from the UK, then there is no mandatory quarantine for the majority of those European countries. In some countries, there is an advisory quarantine. But the UK want to try and smoothen this out with this map that they're going to reveal, where they're going to grade countries green, amber, red, depending on the risk. And ultimately, if it's green or amber, the Brits will be able to go and come back without quarantine. But I feel that there really isn't enough change in terms of we are still very much in a pandemic. There are still no health protection measures for aviation. The UK is still shying away from announcing a testing plan for passengers like the rest of the world. And the conversations I've had with airline CEOs say that this do nothing approach is not sustainable, maybe for July and August, but not much longer yeah. than Professor that. Professor Devi Sridhar, it seems the air bridge... Look, I'm really happy that we're going to be allowed to go on holiday, you know, and I think a lot of people are. But perhaps we're not putting our health in front of our desperate need to get away. And there seems to be a sort of inconsistency in the countries that we're planning to go to, because if you look at... There's a list here of active cases. Um, on the one hand, you have, you know, we might be able to go to Greece, for example, which has just under 2,000 active cases, but we can also potentially go to France, which has around uh, 94,000 uh, active cases. Meanwhile, I know we have our Portuguese politician as part of our lineup this morning, and in Portugal, there's 13,000 cases, but apparently Portugal's not going to be on the list. So, can you see, Professor Sridhar, a a problem here with the countries that we might go to and the risks we might be putting ourselves at if we travel there, and also the risks that they might be taking on by receiving us. Yes, definitely. I mean, it's clear that this decision is being driven by economic reasons and not public health ones. And what I would really like to see is you know, Britain being seen as a green country as other countries create their traffic light systems to decide who they want to partner with. I mean, we need to remember there are still serious domestic issues occurring. We still are looking at a local lockdown in parts of the country, you know, overall infections flatlining for most of June. And how do we get kids back in school? How do we get a functioning test and trace system? How do we deal with the problems at home? So while I think it's great to be starting to look at air bridging and opportunities, I would like that to be with other countries which are performing really well rather than right now, which seems kind of a haphazard approach. One of the things, of course, which is being factored in here is the relative economies of all these countries. You know, there will be a lot of French people who want to come to the UK, a lot of UK people want to go to France, same with Italy, Spain, and so on. Um, there is an economic imperative running alongside the public health imperative, isn't there, uh, Dr Shreda? Where, where is that line for you? You've done very well, I know, in Scotland, but where is this line? Well, I think in Scotland right now, it's a slightly different position to England because we have such few cases. We just have a handful of cases. And so if we were going to form air bridges, and I completely agree that we need to start forming international strategies, it would be with high performing countries like New Zealand and Greece and Denmark and Norway, where I think instead, if we're trying to partner with um, other countries that are having infections that are rising, like, you know, France or, or Spain or or other parts of the world, then of course it creates the risk of importing infections um, and how you actually deal with that. Because just as we are allowed to go abroad, others are allowed to come here as well without a quarantine period. And that quarantine is the once you've dealt with community transmission, the main way you have of dealing with imported cases. Why is Portugal likely not to be on the green light list? Well, I think it's about looking at the number of daily new cases or incidents in different countries and trying to assess whether that's at a level which is seen as the risk is acceptable or not. And to be fair, a lot of countries are you know, approaching it in this way, Germany, um, Faroe Islands, Iceland, possibly you know, the Pacific, Pacific countries as well, as they start to open their borders. And so I think, of course, this can change by the day, can change by the week. We see what's happening across the pond in the United States. And so it's a fast moving situation. Well, Ricardo Baptista Leite is uh, in Portugal near Lisbon. I mean, the problem with Portugal is you have a rising number of infections and deaths and there's a local lockdown imminent, isn't there, in the greater Lisbon area. But you feel that Portugal is being unfairly treated by the UK. 
Well, uh, good morning. Uh, the truth is, uh, when we look in terms of deaths, Susana, the truth is Portugal has one of the lowest uh, case fatality rates in the world. Uh, we've been having three to six deaths per day in comparison to the UK with 100, 200 deaths per day. It is not true that we are in lockdown in Lisbon. We have some some measures put in place to make sure that we are controlling the, the pandemic in the region. But when we look at the Algarve, for example, or Porto, which are main destinations for the Brits, we see that we practically, practically have no numbers. And when we compare ourselves to countries that you are considering to green list, like France or Netherlands or even Belgium, uh, it's it's ridiculous, really, to make any comparison well, to consider that ask, Portugal. If, well, in that case, if, you're, if your numbers are so low, why would you risk taking tourists from the UK? Well, the truth is we have a long-standing uh, relationship. When Britain was in its darkest COVID hour with your prime minister laying in an ICU bed, fighting for his life, actually with a Portuguese nurse standing by his side for 48 hours, we never at any moment considered blocking the entrance of our British friends because we've always done so. And, we, you know, people that have to make this decision have to close their eyes and remember their last time in Portugal on a holiday. When they got off the plane, the person that welcomed them here, the receptionist at the hotel, the, the driver... Trouble is, the trouble around. is, if you don't mind me Think just about. jumping in there, the trouble is, yeah, sure. I, I'm not sure that friendship really matters. Uh, what matters is people living or dying. And, and this is part of the problem, is that you're talking about established pre-pandemic relationships, when actually the reality is, this is a global pandemic, we're all in the same boat, and nobody wants these infection rates to go up. And I, I would imagine that Portugal, if you look at someone like New Zealand, they're not letting people in for many, many more months. Um, and there is an argument that countries should be a lot more insular until they really get on top of it. You're absolutely right, Piers. What I'm saying is that, based on that relationship, one would expect that you use fair arguments, scientifically based arguments, rationale arguments. So I ask you, after you close your eyes thinking about your last time in Portugal, open them and look at the numbers. And let's be real. Let's look at France, let's look at Netherlands, let's look at Belgium and look at Portugal and tell me what is the rationale behind this ridiculous decision. Portugal will always welcome the British people as you know and making sure that it is safe for their holidays here and keeping it safe for the Portuguese people. But we will never forget the British government's decision if they decide to block lock us out to put us on a blacklist with no rationale in terms of the scientific numbers and that is the only way we're going to beat this pandemic. Well, Henry um, Smith you're the MP for West Sussex, which I presume, does it include Gatwick Airport? It does, yeah, very much so. OK, so you have a really a vested interest locally in this. You're also chair of the All-Party Future of Aviation Group. I mean, a number of people would say, as much as they want a holiday, uh, that actually this is an irrational decision because it is putting the uh, needs of the economy, the aviation, the tourism industries, above public health and you know that irrationality is seen in the decision to exclude Portugal I mean Portugal has fewer cases than a number of other countries which are going to be green lit well I think uh, we have as a country addressed this on the basis of health this pandemic has been unprecedented around the globe certainly in this country it is unfortunately no exception to that and we have put health at the very top of the agenda. But we also need to start getting our economy going again, because otherwise the other health morbidities and impact on our national wealth will be significant, uh, possibly for uh, a decade or so to come. And that's why we do need to start uh, regenerating our industries. Travel and aviation were one of the first, obviously, to be immediately negatively impacted and will be one of the slowest to recover. So. Getting our economy going again it is very important. It is. Uh, I'll tell you something else that's really important, and that is getting children back into school. And I think uh, for a lot of people, it is remarkable that children will be allowed to get onto a packed plane, uh, which is an enclosed environment, and go off to countries which have, you know, still uh, high infection rates, but they can't get back into a classroom. And we're still months away from children getting an education. Have we got our priorities wrong? 
Well, no, I, I would agree with you. I think children should be uh, going back to school. Obviously, we're almost about to hit what would normally be the summer holidays anyway. Uh, and the government has certainly said that children should be back in school uh, in September uh, for the start of the new academic year. I would have liked to have seen children returning to school because of the extremely low risk in that setting, uh, given the, the so age range. So why has the government not managed to do that? Well, I think there have been a lot of pressures on the government. Uh, there have been... I'm not a member of the government, but... No, but uh, you're I think a member on, of the Conservative on, on, Party. In, indeed so. On the one hand, we've got people who uh, are saying that lockdown measures should continue uh, for the foreseeable future, and then we've got another extreme saying that we should be completely opening up. The truth is somewhere in the middle, and I think that is broadly where we are. Now, uh, hindsight's a wonderful thing, and no doubt when there's an inquiry into the response to COVID-19... Uh, the uh, the truth of uh, what we should have done will come out. Uh, but uh, treading that fine line is extremely difficult. So I, I would agree. I think schools should be going back. Is there anything? Is there anything? Our... Is there anything that your Conservative government's done in this pandemic that you would say was good? Yeah, I think the fact that the NHS uh, was in the early days predicted to be overwhelmed and wasn't, the building of the Nightingale Hospital, uh, I think, is an, a remarkable effort uh, that was uh, achieved. But the hospital ba barely got used. Uh, over 300 health and care workers were killed on the front line of this, and you sent 25,000 elderly people back into care homes without testing if they had COVID which created a huge epidemic in care homes. So all this, we saved the NHS from being run over. Actually, all you did was ship it into care homes. Well, that is uh, an aspect that I do think uh, we uh, will need to uh, be investigated. I do think people were perhaps released from health care settings into social care settings uh, too soon. Uh, but certainly um, the predictions at the beginning of this pandemic were that uh, the NHS would be overwhelmed. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, it's been a horrendous experience for this country and uh, many others. Uh, and, as I say, hindsight's a wonderful thing, but we do, I think, now need to get our economy going again. Otherwise, the uh, effects on other health issues, I chair the all-party parliamentary group on blood cancer, for example, uh, the fact that uh, many cancer patients haven't been treated in the way uh, that they should have done because of the focus on COVID-19. Uh, if we are going into a recession, uh, I hope if it is a, a recession, it's a short one. Yeah. But nevertheless, poverty and job losses causes no, ill they're health. All very, they're all very serious. Well 